thank you all for coming. Just we were just saying that the the committee is uh, all over the world here, so we have uh, Amelia just just ran in, and uh, Claire Tomlin is in California. Tomas is on a Perez. It's 4 a.m. in Singapore. He's too. So uh, it's a, an exciting time. So um, it's my uh, my great great pleasure to uh, welcome you today to to introduce Ani for his events. Uh, I think Ani has been ready for this moment for a long time. It was, uh, it was me that wasn't quite ready until today, I think, and I'm not sure I'm ready still. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the story that, uh, of Ani and, and, and our lab, because it's, uh, it's been a fantastic journey. So uh, it started when uh, Dan Kodacek sent me a note saying, I've got this undergrad, he's you know, the best you're going to see you know, ever. You have to take him as a summer student. And I didn't normally take any summer students um, but I couldn't say no to this. So Ani comes for a summer and he helped us with the, the compass gate tripod uh, robot uh, that Zach Joukowsky was building at the time. And, uh, you know, from basically starting from scratch with almost in almost no time, um, he, was start, he started getting real things to work, both in the, in the software and the hardware. It was sort of incredible. So when we had a chance to get him back for grad school, it was a no-brainer for me to, to try to recruit him uh, for, for MIT after that. <clears throat> um, we did a lot of projects. Uh, Ani did a lot of projects while he was here. One of the ones that actually I think is almost the most meaningful for me, we had a bunch of people try to balance a simple acrobat in lab. And we just tried and tried, and it turns out to be really hard. And it became sort of the dragon in the lab that needed to be slayed. And, uh, and at some point, Ani said, you know what, I'm going to take a crack at this. And within basically a week, he had just started from scratch. Uh, you know, got the new robot. It was instantly working. Uh, it made it look totally easy. And, and I think that speaks volumes for his abilities. Um, he's, he's incredibly strong, both in hardware and in theory and in algorithms. Really exceptional across the board, right? So. Uh, he, he graduated from these sort of simple projects, starter projects, to solving really hard problems like trying to fly really fast uh, with fixed-wing aircraft through dense uh, clutter. And he's going to tell you that story today. Uh, <clears throat> there was this sort of joke in lab that Ani started uh, that he said, he said, uh, um, I've been really lucky because I had the desk right next to the postdocs, right? And, and so I got, every time a new postdoc came in, I'd collaborate with these postdocs and I'd get these great new results and, and, uh, and publish these papers in all these different di fields. And um, I don't know, I, I actually think the postdocs were pretty lucky to sit next to Ani. He was, he's been incredibly uh, prolific and, and just, uh, he's not just, you know, uh, a researcher in the group, he's one of the thought leaders in the group and, and really has completely changed the way I think about problems the way a lot of us in the, in the lab think about problems. Um, just recently, in fact, Ani, uh, we, were, we were reminiscing, and he showed me the list of, of people he was thinking about going to work for for grad schools. And, uh, you know, it's an impressive list. And so all I can say, it made me think, uh, Ani, thank you for picking us, because it's been an absolute honor. Uh, and you guys are in for a treat today, and, uh, and boy, we're going to miss you when you're gone. But um, you should expect great things from this guy. He's going to do amazingly well. And I think I'm allowed to say, so uh, he's just decided he's been on the faculty market, and he's just decided he's going to go to Princeton and join the faculty in Princeton uh, in, in the fall. So, well, possibly after a postdoc. So, uh, Ani, take it away. All right, Russ, thanks very much for that introduction. I think it'll be hard to live up to, but I'll, I'll definitely try. So today I'm going to tell you about my research on controlling highly agile robotic systems in a way that allows us to make formal guarantees on their safety. So probably most people in the audience have heard about Amazon's Prime Air. So this is their proposed uh, drone delivery system uh, where the idea is that when you order a new package from Amazon, one of these unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs that you see in, in the picture here, uh, will come and deliver to your doorstep within just a couple of hours. In general, there's been a lot of excitement around the UAV industry. So for example, a number of companies have announced projects and products for a wide range of different applications from mapping cities to doing uh, aerial photography. And while these developments are extremely exciting as a roboticist and also from a uh, consumer perspective, it's maybe not quite so exciting for the FAA. So the Federal Aviation Administration is extremely concerned about these developments. Uh, so currently, they're used to having just a handful of crashes for uh, millions of hours of operation for commercial airliners. Uh, but introducing this kind of autonomy into the loop uh, represents a fundamental shift in the way we need to, need to think about safety and also regulation and certification. 
So probably a lot of people have this really scary image of thousands of these things flying over our heads, running into things, uh, falling out of the sky. And this challenge of safety is a real concern. There are a number of factors that make this challenge even harder. Uh, so first is that we expect these systems to operate in very cluttered environments. So for example, urban environments close to buildings and potentially also even close to human beings. Uh, we also demand speed and agility on behalf of these machines. So there's no point having a drone delivery program if it takes more than a couple of hours uh, for the system to get to your doorstep. And finally, we also uh, expect these systems to deal with unexpected events, so things like wind gusts, for example, or unexpected obstacles in the environment. So it's worth pointing out that these challenges are not restricted just to UAVs. So we face many of the same challenges in a lot of other uh, robotics contexts, such as uh, humanoid robots doing search and rescue missions, or even factory robots working close to human beings. Uh, so these systems must also be able to operate safely while being fast and agile and responding to unexpected events uh, in their environment. So from a theoretical perspective, these applications pose a number of fundamental challenges. So what we'd ideally like to be able to do is formally guarantee uh, that the robot will operate safely. So by safety here, I mean essentially not running into obstacles uh, and not falling out of the sky. Uh, but there are a number of technical uh, factors that make this goal very challenging to achieve. So the first is that the dynamics of these systems can be extremely complicated. So the state spaces can be high dimensional, and we might need to take into account nonlinear complicated effects, uh, such as aerodynamic effects. Uh, there's also significant uncertainty in the dynamics. Uh, so things like wind gusts, for example, or an uncertain payload that the robot might be carrying. And finally, there's also significant uncertainty in the geometry uh, of the, the environment. So typically for these applications, we don't know where obstacles in the environment will be until the robot actually starts operating in that environment and its sensors tell, tell the robot where and what the obstacles look like. So I believe what I'll present today is a, is a partial solution to this ideal goal of formally guaranteeing uh, safe operation of the robot despite these uh, technical challenges. So just to keep the discussion relatively constrained, so for most of the talk, I'll focus uh, on this problem of high-speed unmanned aerial vehicle flight uh, through cluttered environments. But I want to point out that the approach that I'll present is much more general and not tied to the specifics of UAV flight. So I'll present algorithms for designing feedback controllers that uh, come with associated formal guarantees on their safety. And I'll then describe how, these, how we can use these feedback controllers and certificates of safety uh, for safe real-time planning in previously unseen environments. Uh, and along the way, I'll describe a number of hardware experiments on a small fixed-wing airplane dodging obstacles at high speed uh, through previously unseen environments. Okay, so the general problem we're trying to tackle is being able to guarantee that the UAV will fly through some environment uh, without collisions given no prior map of where the obstacles in the environment are. So I'll make a couple of uh, different assumptions. So first I'll assume uh, that we have a reasonably accurate model of the dynamics of the system. So it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but I'll assume that we also have a, a model of the uncertainty uh, and that this uncertainty has a bounded effect uh, on the system. And finally, I'll also assume that, we have, uh, that the robot is equipped with a number of uh, sensors which report where obstacles in the environment are, but up to some finite horizon in front of the robot. Okay, so instead of tackling this completely general problem, for most of the talk, I'll focus on what I consider to be the most important sub-problem, which is how do you plan a single maneuver uh, such that the UAV is guaranteed to be collision-free uh, when that maneuver is executed. So here's the picture I want you to have in your head. So let's say the robot is flying along and suddenly its sensors report a number of obstacles in the environment. Uh, the question is how do you plan a single maneuver such that when that maneuver is executed, uh, the robot is guaranteed to remain collision-free. So let me give you some intuition for some of the technical challenges uh, involved in the task. So first is a combinatorial decision that needs to be made. So should the robot go left around the obstacles? Should it go in between the obstacles? So there's a discrete number of possibilities uh, that it needs to be able to choose from. Uh, we also need to take into account likely tracking error. So for instance, the current state of the robot uh, might not be perfectly aligned uh, uh, with the, the start of the motion plan that the robot made. And more significantly, we also need to take into account uh, the effect of uncertainty or uh, disturbances on the system. So for example, there might be a large wind gust uh, that blows the airplane off its planned trajectory and makes it crash into an obstacle. 
Uh, so what we really need to do is reason about this uh, uh, funnel of possible outcomes. Uh, so the set of states that the robot might be driven into depending on what value the disturbance takes. So different maneuvers also have different susceptibility to disturbances. So for example, it might be a lot easier to fly straight. So in particular, the set of possible outcomes uh, that the robot might be driven to might be a lot narrower as opposed to doing a really aggressive turn to the right uh, where the system is more exposed to wind gusts that can blow it into some uh, large set of possible outcomes. And finally, all of these decisions need to happen in real time. So real time in these kinds of contexts means uh, just small fractions of a second. So there's been a lot of work in the robotics and control literature addressing some of these challenges. Uh, so a lot of the early work and also some more recent work has focused on robust uh, kinematic motion planning. So cases where the dynamics of the system are not uh, dominant and it's purely a geometric problem that you're interested in. So in cases where the dynamics are important, there's been a lot of work under this umbrella of planning under uncertainty, uh, where the main idea is to reason about the dynamics of your system probabilistically and reason about how probability distributions evolve uh, through your dynamics. So there are a couple of uh, important challenges here. So first is that this computational problem of uh, propagating distribution through nonlinear dynamics uh, is computationally very hard. So typically, you're forced to make certain approximations, uh, which make it really uh, very hard to make uh, formal guarantees or uh, say anything formal about what the, the system will do. So slightly closer to the set of assumptions that I've made here is, the, is this work on computing reachable sets, uh, for example, using the hamilton jacobi bellman AJB equation. So it turns out for linear systems plus bounded uncertainty, uh, computing these sets, uh, reachable sets or funnels, as I was calling them previously, uh, can be done very efficiently. Uh, but for nonlinear systems plus bounded uncertainty, uh, computing these sets is, is very challenging. So it's worth remembering that even though many of these plots and illustrations that I'll be drawing will be in two or three dimensions, uh, these sets really live in the full 12-dimensional state space of the system. So we need to think about the x, y, z position, uh, the roll pitch yaw, and the time derivatives of all of those numbers. And computing these sets in that kind of high dimensionality is computationally very challenging. Uh, so typically, the, the AJB methods have trouble scaling up beyond about five or six uh, dimensions in your state space unless you, do, uh, unless you exploit special structure in the, the system. So the starting point for the, the approach that I'll describe today is, uh, is a different set of uh, literature within the motion planning community. So in particular, there'll be two phases. So there'll be a computationally intensive offline phase and a very efficient real-time phase. So in the offline phase, what we'll first do is compute a trajectory library for the system. So this is essentially a set of maneuvers that the robot knows how to execute. So things like fly straight, turn left, bank right, and so on. Uh, and this kind of trajectory library idea has been really widely used uh, in some of the most successful robotic systems that have been deployed uh, that need to plan in real time. So what we'll do next is take this trajectory library and augment them, augment it with, uh, with a set of feedback controllers that correct for local deviations uh, from these nominal maneuvers. And for each of these maneuvers and associated feedback controllers, uh, we'll compute funnels uh, around each one of them. So here are three examples of what funnels look like for a UAV system. And what we'll be able to guarantee is if the robot starts off in the inlet of the funnel and executes one of these maneuvers, it will remain within the funnel for the finite duration of that maneuver, uh, despite having bounded uncertainties in the dynamics. OK, so in the real time phase, on the online phase, when the robot actually starts seeing where obstacles in the environment are, uh, the basic idea will be to search through this pre-computed library of funnels and try to find one that's collision free. So in particular, if you're able to find one that's collision free, then this guarantees that the robot will remain collision free when that maneuver is executed. Uh, because if the funnel doesn't intersect any of the obstacles and the robot will remain within the funnel, uh, then the robot won't collide with any of the obstacles. OK, so that's the, the high level approach. Let me now dig into some of the details of the computations and the approach. OK, so in the offline phase, uh, what we'd like to be able to do is, given a control system of this form, uh, we'd like to be able to design a feedback controller that minimizes the, the size of the funnel. So we'll fix the, the initial condition set uh, and try to minimize the set of possible outcomes that the robot might be driven to, uh, depending on what value the disturbance takes. So instead of describing the solution to this problem, let me actually first start by describing something that might be uh, more familiar to people in the audience. 
Uh, so probably a lot of people have heard about Lyapunov analysis in the context of proving global asymptotic stability for nonlinear systems. Uh, but you can also do Lyapunov analysis for uh, regional stability. So let's say you're given a dynamical system uh, where the controller is fixed. So the, the dynamics just depend on the state here. And let's say we're interested in showing that for any initial condition in this gray region that, that I've drawn here, uh, this initial condition will asymptotically approach the origin. So one way to prove this is to find a Lyapunov function, so a function uh, for which the, uh, this gray set that I've drawn uh, is a sub-level set of this function. So sub-level set here just means all the states x for which the value of the function is less than or equal to rho. So rho is 100 in this picture that I've drawn. So if we can show that the value of this function is positive on the set uh, and the time derivative is negative, so in other words, along trajectories of your system, you're going uh, downhill on this function. So intuitively, it should be clear that if your function looks sort of like a bowl and you're going downhill along trajectories, then you'll asymptotically uh, approach the origin. You can use a similar kind of idea for uh, computing funnels. So we'll represent the funnel as a time-varying sub-level set of this time-varying function v. And what we want to do in this case is not guarantee asymptotic stability, but guarantee invariance instead. So you want to say that when the robot starts off uh, in this initial condition set and executes this uh, maneuver, it'll remain within this time-varying sub-level set uh, for the finite duration of that maneuver. And you write down a slightly different Lyapunov condition in this case, uh, which says that when v equals rho, so in other words, when you're on the boundary of the funnel, uh, v dot is less than rho dot. So essentially, on the boundary, uh, the vector field is pointing inwards. You never, you never leave the funnel uh, if you started within it. So in the kinds of uh, contexts in which we're interested in here, it's also really important to take into account the effect of uncertainty or disturbances uh, on the system. So you can do a similar kind of uh, analysis when you have bounded uncertainty that your dynamics are subject to. Uh, so in this case, we, what we want to so show is that if your state starts off in the inlet and you execute this feedback controller, you'll remain within the funnel uh, despite having these, these bounded uncertainties. And the Lyapunov condition you write down is essentially the same as before, except that now you impose it for all possible values of the disturbance in some set of disturbances, W, that you care about. So essentially, we're doing a worst case analysis here by finding a common uh, Lyapunov function. OK, so I've described these, uh, these mathematical conditions for uh, computing funnels. Uh, but how do we actually put these on a computer in order to, to actually compute them? So the first thing we'll do is restrict the dynamics of the system to polynomials. So this might seem like somewhat of a restriction to, to begin with. Uh, but in practice, it turns out not really to be the case. So for many uh, nonlinear systems that we encounter in practice, relatively low degree uh, Taylor approximations uh, do a good job of capturing the nonlinearities. And moreover, for many classes of systems, uh, such as most uh, rigid body systems, you can do some clever variable substitutions that turn the dynamics into polynomials. But unfortunately, uh, even for polynomial systems, checking this invariance condition that we're interested in is an NP-hard decision problem. So the next observation is that these Lyapunov conditions that we're interested in are essentially checks on non-negativity of functions. So we want to check things like v greater than 0, v dot less than 0. Uh, but again, even for polynomial functions, checking non-negativity is, is NP-hard. So the idea behind some of this quest programming is to check a sufficient condition for polynomial non-negativity, uh, which is that your polynomial is a sum of squares of other polynomials. So this is clearly a sufficient condition for the polynomial being non-negative for all x. Uh, and, and it turns out you can do this pretty efficiently uh, using semi-definite programming, uh, which is a particular kind of convex optimization problem. Uh, so this idea goes back to Pablo Perillo's PhD thesis and, and has been really widely used uh, in the control literature for doing Lyapunov analysis. So there's one last thing I want to point out in the slide, which is that we're really more interested in checking conditions of this form. So we want to check that when x belongs to some set f, then v dot is less than 0. And it turns out you can also check uh, conditions like this using sums of squares programming. OK, so let me give you some more details on sums of squares or SOS programming. So I want to make sure that people uh, go away with the, at least the main idea behind it. So it turns out that a polynomial p being a sum of squares is equivalent to being able to write it down in this form. So if you can write it down as v transpose qv, uh, where v is a vector of monomials, so essentially contains uh, products of the variables in x. 
uh, and Q is a positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, and this is the condition that makes this a semi-definite programming problem. So you can use this to check if a polynomial is a sum of squares. So if I hand you a polynomial, you can go try to find a, a matrix of this form uh, such that this equality holds. And this would be a certificate that uh, P is a, is a sum of squares. Uh, but more importantly for us, you can also search over the space of sums of squares polynomials uh, by searching over uh, this, the positive semi-definite matrices Q. And this is essentially what allows us to search over Lyapunov functions when we're doing Lyapunov analysis. OK, so going back to the original problem I started off with, uh, you can also do feedback control synthesis uh, with this kind of idea, uh, essentially by finding a Lyapunov function and a feedback controller. So unfortunately, it turns out that the joint, this joint synthesis of feedback control and Lyapunov uh, functions is not quite a sum of squares program. But it turns out if you fix one of the variables, so for example, if you fix the Lyapunov function, uh, you can search for the feedback controller using SOS programming. And similarly, if you fix the feedback controller, uh, you can search for the Lyapunov function. So the basic idea here is just to alternate between these two sets of decision variables uh, while trying to minimize the size of the funnel. OK, so I've described these computational techniques for, for computing funnels. Uh, but probably one question that everyone in the audience has. Yes, sorry. Yep. So, so you, you alternate yep. you know, between these two steps, right? Yep. What can you say about you know, what happens? Yeah, so, so there's relatively little that you can say. So what you can say is that this alternation will converge uh, yeah, to something. Uh, but you can't really say. It will converge. Yeah, it'll converge, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so probably one question that a lot of people in the audience have is, uh, do these guarantees that we compute using uh, some of the squares programming really mean anything on a real challenging hardware system? So the hardware system I'll present experiments on is a small fixed-wing airplane. Uh, so I spent a lot of time doing system identification for the system to get an accurate 12-state dynamic model. Uh, so I'm treating the system as a rigid body subject to aerodynamic forces, where the lift and drag coefficients uh, come from a flat plate model plus a small correction term. So I refined this model, parametric model, using lots of data from flights. So I essentially ran the airplane with different open loop control inputs and used this to refine the parametric model. And I was also taking into account uh, parametric uncertainty in the model, which I decreased as I collected more data uh, and as the, as the model uh, improved. So it's worth pointing out that uh, I'm essentially hiding months worth of work here in this one bullet point. So with any kind of model-based uh, approach, uh, doing system, system identification is important and can, can be quite challenging. But I won't say too much about the modeling unless people ask me at the end. So the experiments that I'll show uh, will be in a motion capture arena, and all of the computation is on an off-board platform. OK, so here's a visualization of what uh, one of these funnels looks like. Uh, so it took about 30 minutes or so to compute on a standard uh, desktop computer. Uh, and one thing that's worth remembering is that uh, even though these visualizations will be in three dimensions, uh, these funnels really live in the full 12 dimensional state space. So I'm just projecting them down onto three dimensions in order to be able to visualize them. So here's a visualization of the airplane flying through one of these funnels. Uh, so you get a, an idea for what that looks like. So I hope you enjoy these visualizations, by the way. They took me about uh, two weeks to, to make. <laughs> OK, so from, from these videos, it looks like the, the airplane is remaining within the funnel, as you would hope and expect. Uh, and I did a, a lot of hardware uh, experiments to actually validate this. So I did 30 flights from different initial conditions uh, that start off in the inlet of the funnel. Uh, and all 30 of these trajectories remained within the full 12-dimensional funnel, uh, as you would hope and, and expect from sums of squares. So here's a plot that shows that. So what I'm plotting on the y-axis is the value of our Lyapunov function uh, as a function of time for each of these 30 trajectories. And I've just normalized things so that the one level set uh, corresponds to the, the boundary of the funnel. So essentially, anything less than one is inside the funnel. Anything greater than one is outside. Uh, so as you can see, all 30 of these trajectories start off in the inlet and then remain within the funnel. Uh, so these guarantees uh, that we were writing down with some of the squares actually translate onto the real uh, hardware system, which is quite nice. OK, so let me quickly summarize uh, where we are so far. 
Uh, so I've described how we can use SOS programming for computing funnels, uh, which allows us to reason about the nonlinear dynamics of the system and also uncertainty in the dynamics. Uh, so I presented these hardware experiments on a small fixed wing airplane. Uh, and one of the things I was slightly surprised by was that some of the SQS programming was actually able to handle this kind of dimensionality. Uh, so I mentioned that the DHJB approaches typically uh, scale up to about five or six dimensions. Uh, and when I first started working with SOS, I wasn't sure if, if, if it would be able to handle this kind of uh, dimensionality. Uh, so I presented these experiments validating uh, that the funnels actually make sense on this uh, physical hardware system. Uh, and one thing that I want to point out is that even though there's been a lot of work in the controls community uh, using some of the squares programming for doing Lyapunov analysis and control synthesis, uh, there's been pretty very little in the way of actual hardware implementation and validation. Uh, so as far as we know, these experiments that I presented today and another set of experiments that I did a couple of years ago, uh, and some more experiments actually from our lab by Joe Moore. Uh, so th these are the first to, to do this kind of thorough hardware implementation and validation on hardware. Okay, so I want to next transition to the online uh, or real-time computation. So again, the question is how do you deal with obstacles that are reported by the sensors at runtime? So the basic idea is to search through this pre-computed library of funnels and try to find one that's collision-free. Uh, so more precisely, what we want to do is find one whose projections onto the space in which the obstacles live, uh, that projection is collision-free. So the nice thing about this is that this is purely a geometric problem. So we don't have to reason about the nonlinear dynamics of the system or the uncertainty in the dynamics. Uh, all of that complexity is summarized within the, the geometry of the funnel. Uh, and we can leverage some pretty mature collision checking libraries to do this collision checking at uh, real time rates. So real time here means approximately uh, 50 to 100 hertz. So I was using the bullet collision library, which is used in a, in a number of video game engines. Okay, so one question I haven't really addressed yet is what if we cannot find a, a collision-free funnel in your library? Uh, so one idea is to exploit invariances or symmetries in the dynamics. So in particular, the uh, dynamics of a UAV system are, in, are invariant to shifts in XYZ and also rotations in yaw. So what this means is we can take a funnel that's computed in some location and essentially move it around and still have the shifted funnel be valid uh, uh, for, the, for the system. But of course, you can't shift the funnel around arbitrarily, so you still need to make sure uh, that you're actually able to execute the shifted funnel. Uh, so you need to make sure that the, the current state of the robot is contained within the, the inlet of the funnel. But if you can find uh, a shift that satisfies these conditions, uh, then again, you're guaranteed that if you execute this shifted funnel, uh, you'll remain collision-free. And it turns out you can handle or search over a, a subset of these shifts uh, using convex, quadratically constrained, quadratic programming, uh, which is a, another uh, kind of convex optimization problem that we can again uh, solve in real time for this particular problem. Okay, so the hardware experiments that I'll present next. Uh, so I computed. Yes. Go ahead. So uh, <coughs> the quadratic program gives yeah. you the quadratic constraints gives you how much you can move the the, uh, the funnel right while staying in the inlet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that doesn't allow you to check for which one of the funnels is, is in collision. So that they will not be complex. Yeah, that's correct. So we have a, essentially a convex uh, relaxation. Uh, well, not relaxation, the, the opposite of relaxation. We have sufficient conditions uh, that you can check using convex QCQP. So the basic idea is to actually find separating hyperplanes. So uh, also complexify the, the free space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, so in these experiments that I'll present, so there's 40 pre-computed funnels uh, along these different maneuvers that you see in the picture here. Uh, so in, these, in the video that you're about to see, the planner is not informed where obstacles in the environment are uh, until the robot clears the launcher. So as soon as the robot clears the launcher, uh, so I tell it here's a bunch of obstacles in front of you, these, this is what it looks like, and it needs to do this planning with funnels in real time. So here's a video with uh, real obstacles in the environment. Crashing into a net at the end, by the way. It's not crashing into the wall. <laughs> yeah, also the obstacles fell out of MIT. <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, so here are some examples of what the, the plan funnels look like for these different environments. Uh, so as you can see, they're all collision-free. And one thing that's really important to point out is the, the importance of exploiting these invariances or symmetries. Uh, so in particular with the object, with the environment rather, with the, the hoop in it, uh, you would have to get extremely lucky to find a, a funnel that fits exactly in between the hoop. But if you exploit symmetries, then you can just shift the funnel out of collision and, and uh, execute the shifted funnel instead. Uh, so this, these exploiting symmetries gives you a lot of expressivity in terms of the, the funnel library. Okay, so one question I haven't addressed yet is what kinds of environments can we, can we actually fly through? Uh, so let me make a couple of really simple observations. So first is that the, the obstacles cannot be too close uh, to the airplane. So in this case, the airplane just won't have enough time to react. Uh, so the obstacles also cannot be too big. So in this case, you might not have a funnel that goes all the way around some large wall, for instance. And finally, the, the gap between the obstacles needs to be large enough uh, for the system to actually fit through. So it turns out you can derive some pretty simple geometric conditions on the environment, so the gap between the obstacles and so on, uh, that guarantee, that that guarantee collision-free flight. And as you would expect, these, these geometric conditions depend on the, the geometry of the, the funnels in your library. And the basic idea is to write down these geometric conditions such that uh, you can guarantee that there's some gap uh, between the obstacles uh, such that there's some funnel in your library that, that fits through this gap. Okay, so so far I've focused on this uh, important sub-problem of choosing a single maneuver, uh, but I want to now zoom out to the more general problem of flying continuously through some environment. Uh, so the first idea we can leverage is that of sequential composition, so it's also known as pre-image backchaining or, or goal regression. Uh, so it's a pretty old idea in robotics, uh, and what it says is that two funnels are sequentially composable if the outlet of one lies completely within the inlet of the next one. And if you can compose funnels in this manner, then you can essentially execute one after the other. So you can check this compatibility condition between funnels using a simple uh, sum to squares program offline. And what this allows you to do is plan sequences of funnels. So you can take some uh, finite library of funnels that you computed and stitch them together to create richer motion plans. Uh, but we still have this issue of having a finite sensor horizon, so we can't actually see all the way uh, through, to the end, through to the end of the environment. Uh, so what do we do about this? Okay, so instead of presenting the, the formal algorithm, I think it's easiest to explain the, uh, the algorithm with the video. Uh, so in the video here, you'll see a quadrotor system uh, which has 12 states, a 12-dimensional state space and, and four control inputs. And there's an uncertain crosswind that's blowing the, the quadrotor around in this horizontal direction. So the basic idea is to plan a sequence of funnels for the, the portion of the environment that you can see. Uh, you then start uh, executing the sequence and essentially replan as, as more obstacles in the environment are, are reported. So this is essentially receding horizon planning uh, with funnels. And it turns out you can again write down uh, some simple geometric conditions on the environment uh, that guarantee that a collision-free funnel will always be found uh, when you do this replanning. So essentially you can fly forever uh, for, through an environment which satisfies these geometric conditions. Okay, so I presented this approach for doing real-time robust planning with, uh, with funnels, and I presented a number of hardware experiments on a small fixed-wing airplane dodging obstacles at high speed through previously uh, unseen cluttered uh, environments. Uh, and one thing that's worth pointing out is that often people associate uh, robustness with really conservative uh, behavior, uh, but it might be slightly surprising to note that that's not necessarily the case. So in the videos that you saw with the airplane, uh, the airplane is doing some really aggressive maneuvers uh, while still being robust. So I presented how you can fly continuously through some environment using this receding horizon planning approach. Uh, and finally, you can again write down these constraints on your environment uh, that guarantee that a collision-free funnel will always be found. Okay, so so far in this talk, I've focused on this problem or domain of uh, UAV flight. Uh, but I want to point out again that this funnel library-based approach is much more general. Uh, so for example, you could imagine using it for doing footstep planning uh, on a humanoid robot on in intermittent terrain, where the idea would be to pre-compute a, a library of funnels that correspond to different footstep placements, and then choose from this library based on what the environment, oh, sorry, what the, uh, the terrain looks like. Uh, but there's a really big question here, which is can we scale our computations, or our funnel computations, uh, to anything on the order of a humanoid uh, robot. So even relatively simplified models of these systems can have as many as 30 to 50 uh, dimensions in their state space. 
so this last uh, technical section is joint work with uh, Amir Ali Ahmadi uh, from Princeton. Okay, so before addressing this challenge of scalability, let's first understand where uh, the, the limitations or the computational limitations of some of the squares programming actually come from. So here's a quick reminder. So a polynomial P is a sum of squares, uh, if and only if you can write it down in this form, uh, where Q was this positive semi-definite matrix that we were searching for. And it turns out it's really this condition uh, that's, that's expensive to impose. Uh, so as the number of variables in your uh, polynomial grows, so as your state space grows, and also as the degree of these polynomials grows, uh, the size of this matrix grows pretty rapidly. So if you were doing Lyapunov analysis for a cubic system, so a degree three uh, polynomial system in 20 uh, states, uh, you would have more than a million decision variables in your optimization problem. And imposing this positive semi-definiteness constraint or PSD condition uh, gets very expensive very quickly as the size of the matrix grows. So there's been a number of really interesting approaches for addressing this challenge of scalability. Uh, so for example, techniques for exploiting special structure, uh, such as symmetry or sparsity in the problem, uh, and also customized algorithms such as first order methods or subgradient methods uh, for many special classes of problems. So the approach that we've taken in this work is, is somewhat different. Uh, so our approach is essentially not to work with the sum of squares polynomials to begin with. Uh, what we do instead is give other sufficient conditions for polynomial non-negativity that are stronger than sums of squares but significantly cheaper. So one way to think about this is that we're really searching over a subset of the SOS polynomials, uh, but these subsets are much more tractable to optimize over. Okay, so how do we actually search over these subsets? Uh, so the basic idea is to replace this expensive PSD condition on the matrix Q. Uh, with something that's stronger but a lot uh, computationally cheaper to impose. So we've proposed a couple of different conditions, so I'll describe uh, two of them here uh, because they're particularly nice. Uh, so the first one is diagonal dominance. So matrix Q is diagonally dominant. Uh, for each row in the matrix, uh, the diagonal element is greater than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of the off-diagonal elements. And the nice thing here is that you can impose this condition uh, using linear programming constraints on the elements of your matrix. So the second condition is scaled diagonal dominance. So matrix Q is scaled diagonally dominant if you can multiply it by a positive uh, diagonal matrix and have the product be diagonally dominant. And it turns out you can impose these conditions using second order uh, cone programming constraints. So this leads to two classes of polynomials which we call the, the DSOS and the SCSOS polynomials uh, when you do this replacement from PSD to DD or STD. And the really cool thing here is that both linear programming and second order cone programming are significantly uh, cheaper than semi-definite programming. Uh, so this gives us the, this extra scalability. And for those of you in the audience who are uh, really familiar with some disquest pro <coughs> sorry, some disquest programming, uh, you might be familiar with some deep results from real algebraic geometry on the gap between uh, sums of squares and non-negative polynomials and how you can close this gap using multiplier polynomials. And many of these same results also go through in the, the DSOS and the SCSOS setting. Okay, so going back to the original question I started this subsection off with, uh, can we scale our computations to anything on the scale of a humanoid robot? Uh, so we applied this DSOS and SCSOS techniques to design a balancing controller for a, a model of the, the Atlas humanoid robot on its toe. Uh, so I'm using a somewhat simplified model of the system which has 30 dimensional state space uh, and 14 control inputs. So all the physical and inertial parameters are realistic, uh, but one simplification that I've made is that there's a, there's a pin joint at the interface between the, the foot and the ground. Uh, so what we're doing here is simultaneously searching for a Lyapunov function and a feedback controller in order to maximize the, the size of the region of attraction for the system. So essentially the set of states, initial conditions, uh, from which the, the controller is able to stabilize the system. And it's worth pointing out that this problem is way beyond uh, what sums of squares programming can, can currently handle. Okay, so here's a video of what the, the controller looks like. So what I'm doing here is uh, randomly sampling different initial conditions and running the feedback controller uh, from these different initial conditions. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you're, it, the controller is able to stabilize a pretty wide range of uh, different initial conditions. Uh, so this controller was designed using uh, SCSOS programming, which is the second order cone programming version. 
Okay, so we propose these scalable alternatives to some to squares programming, uh, which are based on linear and second order cone programming. Uh, so this scales to problems well beyond what uh, some of the squares can currently handle. Uh, so in this talk, I described this 30 state and 14 control input uh, humanoid model. Uh, but in some other work, we've applied these techniques for a, in, a, in a whole range of different applications from machine learning to uh, statistics and uh, finance. And in each of these cases, uh, we see really large gains in terms of scalability uh, with relatively little loss in terms of the conservatism of the solutions we obtain. Uh, and finally, there's also some really exciting potential for real-time applications uh, with these approaches. Uh, so I described the, the advantage that we have in terms of scalability for large-scale systems. Uh, but for smaller-scale systems, uh, it might actually be feasible to, uh, to solve these problems uh, in real-time, uh, so doing feedback control synthesis or potentially even funnels. Okay, so I believe that the, the approach that I've presented has a lot of potential for being uh, deployed on uh, real robots to make them operate safely in real-world environments. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, so let me, in the last couple of minutes, uh, describe some of the challenges and also some uh, potential future directions. Okay, so in the, the experiments with the, uh, the fixed-wing airplane that I presented, so I did dozens of uh, different flights in different uh, environments uh, with different kinds of obstacles. Uh, and there was only a single flight that led to a collision with, uh, so a single uh, failure case uh, where, where the airplane collided with one of the obstacles. Uh, so this is what it looks like. So it's actually kind of hard to, to see from the, the video, but if you listen really carefully, uh, you'll hear that the, one of the wingtips just uh, clips one of the obstacles on its way through. Uh, so this essentially happened due to uh, unmodeled actuator saturations. Uh, so I wasn't taking into account the fact that the, the actuators of the robot saturate. Uh, so it's actually possible to, to take these ac into account using some of the squares programming, but I chose not to do so, uh, essentially to make the computation simpler and just to make my life easier. So this particular failure case could have been avoided if, if I did a more careful uh, analysis uh, or computations with the funnels. Uh, but in general, even though hopefully I've convinced you that these model-based techniques are extremely powerful, uh, these models are still only approximately valid even when you include things like uncertainties on the actual hardware system. So I think one really interesting and important research question is how can we augment uh, some of the formal model-based tools that I've presented in this talk uh, with data-driven or, or learning-based approaches. So I think there's a big opportunity in terms of the, the vast amounts of data we can collect from real-time uh, operation of the system. And the question is, how can we take this data and augment our model-based tools? So one approach might be to just make local adjustments to the dynamics of the system. Uh, but a potentially more interesting approach might be to make adjustments or local adjustments to the funnels uh, them themselves from data. So let's say you computed a funnel using some nominal model of your system and uncertainty. But in practice, you found that there was some unexpectedly large wind gust, for example, uh, that blew you out of the funnel. So the idea here would be to update the funnel in a way that the, the updated funnel is consistent with this new piece of data that you saw, uh, and to do this iteratively as you collect more, uh, more data. In general, I believe that really successful robotic systems of the future will have a really strong model-based component, uh, but will also augment some of these model-based techniques with uh, data-driven or, or learning-based approaches. So another question I haven't really addressed yet in this talk is the question of sensing. Um, so how do you actually detect where obstacles in the environment are? So there's been some really exciting recent work on fast uh, stereo vision, so a lot of it from our lab by Andy Barry, who's here. Uh, so for example, doing sparse versions of stereo or even doing full stereo on, on FPGAs. Uh, and I think it's, be it's become feasible to do this obstacle detection at real-time rates. Uh, but I think from a research perspective, one question that I find really fascinating is do we even need accurate geometric representations of the world uh, in order to be able to navigate through it? So in, in practice, relatively simple sensing strategies can work quite well. So there's one particular example from EPFL that I like uh, where they have this array of optical mice, uh, so the same kind of optical sensor your computer mouse uses measuring optic flow in about uh, seven or eight different directions. So it's very sparse and simple kind of uh, sensing. Uh, but they were able to use it to, to do the kinds of obstacle avoidance maneuvers that you see in the, the video here. 
Uh, so one research, interesting research question is can we make the same kinds of guarantees that I was describing in this talk uh, with these very simple sensing strategies. Uh, so I think this has the potential to be much more computationally efficient, uh, but potentially much more robust also to sensing uncertainty. So instead of trying to accurately model where everything in the environment is, uh, if you just measure the right things really well, th then this might be much more uh, robust. So an even more general uh, version of this question is what should we sense or estimate? So I think these are really exciting times in robotics where there's a new sensor that comes out every couple of months. Uh, but this begs the question, what do we really <coughs> need to sense or estimate in order to be able to achieve the, the task that we're trying to achieve? So I think a really important fundamental open problem uh, is, this, is developing a general approach for what you might call uh, task-relevant estimation and control. Uh, so the question is, what are the minimal informational requirements for a given task? Uh, how do you extract this information from your sensors and then uh, still be able to guarantee that you'll achieve the, the task that you're trying to achieve? And I think a, a general approach to this kind of problem can have a huge impact on the robustness of our uh, robotic control systems and get us a lot further along this dream of having robots operating safely uh, in real-world environments. Okay, so that's the, the end of the, the technical section of my talk. So I want to end by thanking uh, a number of people who made this work possible. Uh, so I want to start by thanking Russ Tedrick, my advisor. Uh, so like Russ mentioned at the beginning, I joined his lab as an undergrad student at the end of my junior year over the summer. Uh, and I actually came down for a, a one-day interview uh, before, uh, before that summer. And I actually went back home really disappointed with myself uh, because I thought I'd done really poorly on the, the interview. I couldn't remember a single uh, intelligent thing uh, that I said during the day. Well, thankfully, Russ thought otherwise and, and uh, saw enough in me to, uh, to give me the chance to, to work in his lab. So I've worked with Russ now and known him for about six years now. And, and throughout this time, he's been a really amazing uh, advisor, uh, mentor, and also friend. Uh, so I've learned, of course, a lot of technical material from Russ, um, but I think, and also received lots of advice on, on career uh, matters, which have been really, uh, really important. But probably the most important thing that I've learned uh, uh, is the, the art of doing uh, good research. Uh, so how do you pick problems? Uh, more importantly, what problems to, to not pick and who to, who to collaborate with and so on. Uh, and throughout the time that I've known Russ, he's been a real inspiration and a model and an ideal uh, towards which to, to strive. So thanks, Russ, for giving me the, the chance to work with you. So I also want to thank my thesis committee, Tomas Lozano Perez, uh, Claire Tomlin, and uh, Emilio Frizzoli. Uh, so they really helped guide uh, this research that, I, that you saw today with lots of questions, advice, uh, comments, uh, and a lot of pointers to, to relevant work. And I think it's safe to say that uh, the work that you saw today would not have been the, the same without their guidance. So I want to also thank a number of my collaborators and co-authors that I had the, uh, the good fortune to, uh, to collaborate with over my time as a PhD student. Uh, so I've learned a, a tremendous amount from these research interactions, uh, but maybe even more importantly, they've also become really good friends of mine uh, uh, throughout, throughout this process. Uh, and in general, I want to thank all the, the members of the, the Robot Locomotion Group. So the, the composition of the group, I think, has changed pretty dramatically since uh, when I first joined as, a, as an undergrad. So I think I'm correct in saying that there's uh, essentially no one from, from when I joined that's, uh, that's still around. So there have basically been two versions of the, the group that I've interacted with. Uh, and again, I've learned a tremendous amount from these interactions. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure to work alongside you guys and, and learn a lot from you. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank a number of people uh, who had a big influence on me during my time as an undergrad at Penn. Uh, so Dan Kodachek, Dan Lee, and Vijay Kumar had a, in particular had a huge influence uh, on the way I think and also the way I approach research. So of course, I want to thank my parents, uh, sister, and family, a number of whom are here. Uh, so thank you for giving me the, the platform uh, on which to, to build my dreams. And I just want to end by thanking the, the MIT uh, community as a whole. Uh, so I dreamt of coming here to MIT since I was about 11 or, or 12 years old. Uh, and it's been a real honor and a pleasure to, to work uh, alongside you guys. All right, I'll end there with this contribution slide and, and take any uh, further questions you might have.
No questions. Uh, for the phone squares uh, representation and the uh, diagonal diagonal, yep. what was the difference in the degree of polynomials you were able to use? So actually, the, the main comparison was, we did was fixing the degree and increasing the, the dimension. Uh, so we were able to round those for quartic polynomials, degree 4 polynomials, uh, in up to 70 variables uh, for a problem of minimizing a, a quartic form on a sphere. Um, so yeah, essentially, I mean, you can, you can try to increase either the degree or the dimensionality. Uh, if you increase both, it will uh, grow exponentially, but if you fix one, then it's polynomial in the other. Yep. When you're thinking about uh, sequential composition of funnels, is that just a check you do afterwards to see you compute a bunch of funnels and then see which ones you can, can compose, or do you think about composition when you're designing the funnel? Yeah, so it's, I mean, typically I, I do it at, like, at the end, so I compute something and then and check. I mean, it would be nice to be able to design the libraries in a way that they were sequentially composed. I mean, is there like easy sort of bounds you can put on? these are going to be my input sizes, and I know roughly with those input sizes, these are going to be my output sizes of funnels, and I know I'm going to be able to have some success in changing Yeah, them. I mean, you can write down some simplistic conditions, like sufficient conditions, yeah. such that if they're satisfied by all the funnels, then you're uh, then you'll be sequentially conditioned. <coughs> yep. Do you include any estimation on certain funnels? Like, if you go in your own position and in optional positions? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So in, in the work that I presented today, I wasn't doing that. Uh, so it's relatively easy to extend the framework to cases where you have worst case uncertainty in the, the sensing. Uh, so you can essentially do worst case estimation of your state estimates uh, as you get more and more measurements. And with the obstacles, I'm basically assuming that you have some bounds on whether you're guaranteed to lie. <coughs> yeah. And I think the so one direction that I didn't really mention is uh, making guarantees which are probabilistic in, in nature. So I think for a lot of these sensing models that we have, uh, worst case guarantees don't necessarily uh, make a huge amount of sense. Uh, so in that case, you can, you can try to say things like, I'll not hit the obstacles with at least 95% uh, probability, and things like that. Good question here. Yep. Did you try finding like, um, a parameterization for the library instead? Oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's something that uh, we did a couple of years ago. So one simple kind of parameterization here that I was using was just exploiting these symmetries or invariances so that you can think of that being a continuously parameterized family of funnels. Uh, but you can also compute a single, so with a single sum of squares program, you can compute a, a continuously parameterized family of funnels uh, in shifts in, in the non-invariant or non-cyclic dimensions also. And that can give you some uh, uh, more like expressivity in your, in your library. Yep. Uh, you mentioned updating funnels based on real data. Do you yeah. think you could also generate funnels based on real data, like from RC pilots and things like that? Yeah, potentially. I mean, one approach might be to maybe see the, the Lyapunov function using uh, data that you collect from, from expert demonstrations and try to maybe find a Lyapunov function that satisfies uh, those constraints. And you might actually be able to use that to do inverse reinforcement learning or apprenticeship learning. Uh, so instead of trying to find an optimal controller, you try to find a, uh, an inverse the other function, essentially. Yep, John? Um, Ian, you mentioned non-geometric sensing and yeah. sexual representation. Um, but funnel is fundamentally geometric and yep. when you check it against obstacles. Can you talk a little bit about how you would stitch together those two ideas? Yeah, so I mean, this, so Pete, for example, from our lab has, has been trying to work on, on something similar where essentially you could imagine think of computing funnels uh, maybe in the, the sensor space or the, the image space. Uh, so in that case, it's not quite a geometric representation, but it's, a, I mean, it's output feedback, if you like, or uh, it's, it's a more like sensory kind of representation. Uh, so that might be one way to, to approach that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anand. All right. Thank you.